Today we're turning to Avatar's fiery big bad that none other than Mark Hamill himself voiced. Man, Luke Skywalker gives good villain. We'll touch on this character's history, his imagery, and naturally make some real-world comparisons to this malevolent lord. What's up, guys? I'm Chris Carr, and today I want to talk to you about Fire Lord Ozai from Avatar The Last Airbender. Instead of asking Nerdwire fans to donate to our Patreon, I want to encourage you to make a donation to Black Lives Matter, or another Black organization. It would be a waste of this platform not to advocate for the Black community, and I hope you'll join us in giving what you can. Any support you can give will go a long way. No act of empathy is too small. Thanks in advance for your donations and your time. Stay safe out there. First, a bit of Lord Ozai's history. Ozai was the second son of Fire Lord Azulon and the younger brother of Fire Prince Iroh. Ozai married a noblewoman named Ursa, the granddaughter of Avatar Roku, and they had two children, Zuko and Azula. For more on Ursa and Ozai's relationship, I definitely recommend you turn to the Avatar comics. If you aren't up for reading them, we've got a video on them that can give you a quick recap. After Ozai's nephew, Iroh's son Luten, was killed in battle, Ozai attempted to manipulate the situation to gain the throne. He asked his father to relinquish the title of Fire Lord to him, as he was capable of maintaining the royal bloodline. Enraged with such a request, Azulon demanded Ozai kill his own son instead, something Ozai was absolutely willing to do. Ursa took matters into her own hands, poisoned Azulon to save her son, but ultimately gave Ozai exactly what he wanted. Iroh was too heartbroken to accept the throne, leading to Ozai's ascent. Now, in case you had any hope of Ozai becoming father of the year, he goes on to battle, permanently scar, and banish his own son, simply for speaking his mind in a military meeting. I guess that's one way to build a 13-year-old's character. Yeesh. There's also definitely some abuse with his daughter Azula, even though she's the preferred child. Zuko would later feel that his banishment freed him from his father's sinister control. Azula stayed under his tutelage and was groomed to be ruthless and thrive off of her father's approval. Ozai determined a person's worth by what they could offer him, their skill set, and he even applied that to his own children. He constantly pitted his kids against one another, favoring his firebending prodigy daughter. He would often say that Azula was born lucky, while Zuko was lucky to be born. You know, nice things you say to your kids. Ugh. Ozai wasn't satisfied with simply ruling the Fire Nation. He wanted global control. He set out to conquer the other nations and dub himself the Phoenix King, the leader of a world reborn in an image of his own design. Unlike his grandfather, father, or brother, Ozai never served as a general and is not confirmed to have served any time in the military. He's more than happy to sacrifice soldiers, though. In addition to his lack of military experience, Ozai further stands out as having the shortest reign over the Fire Nation, a mere five years. This is in stark contrast to the almost 80 years his grandfather Sozin ruled and the 70-some-odd years his father was in power. Despite this short reign, Ozai arguably wields the most power in the Fire Nation's history, overseeing colonies all over the Earth Kingdom, taking Ba Sing Se, and controlling former Air Nomad territories. Despite his tyrannical monarchy, Ozai did usher in some positive changes while ruling. The Fire Nation experienced an industrial boom under his reign, advancing the nation's technology immensely. This is thanks in large part to their bending abilities being able to power their machines, but also thanks to Ozai's push for maintaining a strong military. We know he's behind this industrial revolution by looking at his portrait. Each Fire Lord portrait notes their achievements. Sozin's has his comet, Ozai's has cogs and plumes of black smoke symbolizing industrialization. Ozai essentially is the embodiment of imperialism, extending a country's rule over foreign nations through military force. There are statues and posters idealizing the Fire Lord, and Fire Nation children are given a carefully curated, selective version of the Four Nation's history misleading them about the Hundred Year War. These are similar to the school books used in Japan back in the 1940s, in Maoist China, and still today in North Korea. Ozai's propaganda justified the nation's imperialism and harkens back to the Japanese Empire's own ideological construct, the Great East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere. This justified Japan invading China and the South Pacific, just as Ozai rationalized the attacks on people of the Water Tribe and invading the Earth Kingdom. The Fire Nation attacks against the Air Nomads have also been likened to the Nanjing Massacre, an act of mass murder committed by Imperial Japanese troops against the citizens of Nanjing, the capital of China during the Second Sino-Japanese War. 
Hey guys, I'm certainly not telling you anything new by stating that Ozai is a stand-in for sinister dictators we've seen throughout history, with the Fire Nation's rise to power and eradication of the Air Nomads mirroring these Japanese attacks, or taking inspiration from Germany's actions in mass genocide in World War II. But I do think it's important to explore his megalomaniacal qualities beyond these parallels. Those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it, and understanding what makes a man monstrous is essential to not allowing such rulers rise. And studying media, even fiction, can alert us to some big ol' red flags. Now remember that the Hundred Year War takes place between Sozin's rise and Ozai's. That's years of radicalized rulers seeking to gain more and more control. One-upping their predecessor, gaining more power. Couple that upbringing of superiority with being the second-born son, the lesser son with no real political power, and of course Ozai is going to be a manipulative, power-hungry dude. As I briefly alluded to, I would argue that Ozai exhibits the behavior of a megalomaniac from his deep-seated need to be seen in this grandiose way, as this omnipotent being. The term was first coined by neurologists in the 19th century to detail someone with grandiose delusions. It's used more as a catch-all term for those with an insatiable desire for power, a rocky relationship with reality, and a persecution complex. This also is often used interchangeably when speaking about people who exhibit signs of narcissistic personality disorder. NPD is characterized by an ongoing pattern of exaggerated feelings of self-importance, an inflated need for admiration, and a complete lack of empathy towards others. Both terms have gone hand-in-hand -hand with studies of dictators, and I definitely think they apply to our character study of Ozai. Look at his imagery again. That portrait depicts his hands in a double abhya mudra. This is a gesture of fearlessness or blessing in Buddhism. This doubles down on Ozai's belief that he is bettering the world that he is a blessing. He truly believes that this literal baptism by fire will give birth to a superior world. The portrait also depicts the sun behind the Fire Lord's head. We see a similar design in paintings from the Tang Dynasty and Indian art, where the sun is symbolic of enlightenment. It also could be compared to Christian art, where Christ and saints are depicted with halos surrounding their heads. The Fire Lord's promoting the image that he is close to godliness that he is superior to you. Ozai promotes an idealized version of himself and fully believes he fits that ideal. In his mind, he is the leader the world needs, the leader the world deserves, and his actions are just because he knows what's best. His entitlement and inflated ego paired with his cruelty and political reach is a dangerous combination. It's been said that image is everything, so we should scrutinize and question the images we're presented with. We should check who weaves a political narrative and examine how that narrative suits their needs versus the needs of those they claim to serve. With Ozai, we don't get a nuanced character. We don't get an elaborate backstory. We get a shadowy, sinister figurehead. In a series with a lot of morally gray issues and individuals, Ozai is 100% a villain. This evil is supposed to serve as a foil to our hero Aang. Someone who can find goodness in everyone must defeat somebody void of any and still do so on his own terms. Ozai never had any second thoughts about killing the Avatar. Aang was fully aware that he could be powerful enough to kill Ozai, but then what would make him different from him if he too ended conflict through violence? We need Ozai to be a goatee-stroking, maniacally laughing baddie. Plus, if Ozai is imperialism, if he is the representative of the thematic issue of the show, we can't expect him to be a character with redeeming qualities. He just works, and he's a terrifying character. Not just because of the heinous acts he carries out in the series, but because he's painting by numbers with his reign, taking inspo from terrible history that we've bared witness to in the real world. You should watch that character and think, he's too much. How can anyone allow that kind of person to come into power? And yet history, real history, has shown us that it happens all too easily. I believe the Fire Lord will go down as one of the greatest villains ever seen in media. But of course, that's just my take on Ozai. The question is, what do you guys think of this villain? Did I leave anything important out? Did I miss a big fact? Hit me with your hot takes in the comments below. Thanks to all of you who are making your voices heard, who are standing six feet apart, and still checking out our content. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button and bell so we can keep the conversation going. For more videos, click to the left. Thanks for watching, y'all. See you, Space Cowboy.